We are welcoming in our session Michael Knapp as the first speaker. And please uh, have a screen, one hour, go. Yeah, thank you very much uh, yeah. for the introduction and also for inviting me to this workshop. It's really great that uh, the two Mishas of you, uh, Vadim and um, uh, Hans Christoph, have been putting together this nice uh, workshop. So today I'd like to talk a little about, a dynam about our uh, recent results on the dynamic information of a magnetic impurity in a two-dimensional antiferromagnet. So this work has been mainly carried out by a former PhD student of mine, Annabelle, uh, and has also been done in collaboration with Fabian, Wilhelm, and Frank Bormann. So Annabelle is now uh, studying her postdoc um, at Harvard, just a couple of last week or something. Good. And also, I mean, I think we have a very good connection with the lecture hall. I can hear you very well. Uh, so if you have questions during the talk, please just interrupt me really anytime. Uh, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Okay, so it all starts off with the, yeah. Oh, okay. You've been freezing for five seconds. Typically it's not happening with us. Ah, okay. It was so, the fir um, first, first time at the conference. Oh, wow, okay. okay, but now we see you, yeah. Okay. And we see your screen, very good, continue. So it all starts off with the Fermi-Hubbard model. You know, it describes electrons on the lattice. We are considering here a two-dimensional square lattice. And um, the fermionic species, they are hopping around the lattice. There are two species, red and blue, or spin up and down. And whenever two particles sit on one side, then one has to base an interaction energy U. So the physics of this, of this uh, model is as follows. Uh, when you think about half filling, this means that there is unit density. So there are, yeah, half of, this, uh, half of the sides, there are blue atoms, half of the sides, there are red atoms. Then what happens at high temperature is that entropic effects are winning, right? So the typical state will be some disordered state as indicated here on the right-hand side. When you lower the temperature, at some point, when the temperature is below the local interaction energy, then it's unfavorable to put two particles um, uh, on top of each other and rather uh, a, a, a state with one particle per side is emerging. And this is, however, as you know very well, not the whole story, but when you further lower the temperature, then there's another energy scale, which is uh, coming from the so-called super exchange energy scale which allows um, or which favors a certain spin pattern of neighboring sites or sites of A and B sublattices of this bipartite lattice uh, having alternate spins. And in that way, uh, actually the, uh, the system can lower its energy further because there are virtual exchange allowed from one uh, uh, side to another and back or also with, with spin increase. And okay, this is a very rough um, uh, picture. So what happens now is, I mean, here I'm talking about more local structure, because as we all know that uh, only in two dimensions, only the true ground state at zero temperature is long range ordered. However, uh, strong antiferromagnetic correlations are already emerging at yeah, comparatively high temperatures, let's say. But let's look at this in more detail. So recently there has been enormous success in the development of quantum gas microscopes for these fermionic systems. Quantum gas microscopes are devices which image these fermionic atoms and you can essentially take snapshots of the many body wave function. So you're essentially measuring real space Fock configurations of the two species and you sample by repeatedly taking these measurements, the many body wave function. So here there is an experimental sketch uh, shown from uh, Markus Greiner's group. And it turns out when they lower the temperature as best, as good as they can, this is about 50% yeah, of the super exchange coupling, then they observe, can observe snapshots which are looking like this which are uh, checkerboard ordered. So black and white correspond to uh, spin up and spin down respectively, or red and blue in, the, in, the, in this picture above. Uh, and, and they see that there is a antiferromagnetic ordering, which is extending yeah, almost the whole system. 
So what is the, the physics behind that? So we do know that the correlation length of this antiferromagnet diverges um, 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 yeah, exponentially with the inverse temperature. The formula is given here. And so when you reach essentially a, yeah, a temperature war, at some point, the correlation length is really shooting up. Right, so the temperatures I know up to 0.4 uh, uh, of the hopping scale, they are quite still quite very hot. So they are antiferromagnetic correlations extend maybe nearest neighbors. But when you manage to cool it down yet another factor of two, then the correlation length can uh, go up uh, to 10 lattice sites or something like this. So for the finite size system, what they are looking at, it looks as if it's antiferromagnetically correlated, if, even though we know that ultimately uh, the correlations decay. Well, and of course, I mean, this uh, problem has SU2 symmetry, so there is nothing like a uh, KT transition. So we would have to have yeah, doping or, or other uh, distortions to U1 symmetries for that. Okay, good. So this is the, yeah, still the experimental record of cooling at the moment. So we do speak about ultra cold atoms, uh, but. Uh, for these fermionic systems, they are not so cold as, as, as we know very well. So the temperatures what they're reaching is about, as I already uh, emphasized, 0.5, uh, uh, yeah, half of the super exchange interaction or here, maybe 0.25 of uh, the, the hopping scale for that. Okay, good. So um, what I'm interested in here in this talk is to, um, to, 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 to think about doping these antiferromagnets with holes. And in the beginning, I will specifically just consider of a single hole in this, um, in this, in this antiferromagnet. So we are thinking about the limit of strong interactions, uh, which means that the super exchange is much smaller than the hopping. So this means that we essentially have slow spins and fast holes. In that case, we can perform a schliefer wolf transformation and think about the relevant states in the local Hilbert space. They are consisting now not of the all four possibilities, but it's sufficient actually to keep three possibilities. The first one is uh, no particle, then there is a spin up particle or a spin down particle, but we project out double occupancies. So up down on the semi side is uh, forbidden in this, uh, and this we obtain by Schrieffer Wolf transformation. I don't know, in Arthur Auerbach's book, there's a nice derivation of that. Um, but in the end, we will end up with a DJ model where we have uh, holes or we have electrons hopping around, but with a constraint that there are no double occupancies. Okay, so this is this first term here. And the second term uh, is giving me the spin physics. It's essentially an S dot S interaction uh, of, of the Heisenberg type. So this allows, for instance, for exchange uh, processes where down up is changing into up down. Okay, good. Okay, so that's the setup uh, which we have in our mind. So now, I would like to go on uh, to discussing a bit the physics of a single hole in a one-dimensional system. And I'd like to advocate a bottom picture for that. But before going into that, are there any questions? On that side? <laughs> Maybe not, right? Or yes. Okay, so if this is not the case, uh, let's move on. So the idea is that we punch in a single hole into a one-dimensional system. And for simplicity, you know, I always draw it in that way that we have something like, I mean, we do know this one-dimensional system is of course not antiferromagnetically ordered, also not at zero temperature. We have a Lattinger liquid description with power law correlations of the antiferromagnet. But in my schematics, I always draw it in that way that we have up, down, up, and then a hole punched in, and then it goes on up, down, up. So what does this hole do? What is this baton picture uh, doing for us? It essentially, uh, we think about a hole as being composed of two degrees of freedom. One is the spinon, which carries a fractionalized spin excitation, a spin a half excitation. And then we do have a charge on. A charge on uh, is a spinless um, uh, excitation. And the charge on essentially, this keeps the relative spin orientation intact in the system. So when a charge on moves around, this is somehow shown here in this sketch below. So this, you can think of four 
copies of the same uh, one dimensional chain. And when they look at it at, as a function of time, then bunching in the hole creates a spin defect uh, and the hole. And the hole or the charge on, they can, they can move with one velocity, okay? And then we have here a defect because two spins are pointing in the same direction. That would be the spin. Linguistic question. Uh, was it intentional to avoid the word plasmon? I understand it's loose, but but many people use it still. Okay, but we use we use also in analogy then uh, of a, a slave fermion mean field theory this type of uh, name for this excitation. But this is I mean semantics. Uh, what I mean with that is precisely this this kind of thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. And so uh, we have this charge on which is moving around and it leaves the spin background intact except for one point where the spin on is leaving, right? And the spin on uh, can also propagate by a spin exchange. So let's do it here, for instance, we move down up to up down, then the new defect has moved one, uh, well, it skips one side, it stays on the same sublattice, right? So this is how my, my defect moves. And essentially, yeah, they are two independently propagating particles, and this is what is called spin charge separation. So there's a deconfinement of spin ons and charge ones. Uh, and we have, and they have two velocities. And this has been experimentally seen uh, in many incarnations and uh, uh, both in ultracoid atoms experiments and also in solid state experiments. Okay, good. So and what I would like to uh, uh, do now is to think about uh, the single hole spectral function, which can be measured with angle resource photo emission spectroscopy. Since we have spin charge separation, the spectral function can be thought of as a yeah, convolution of a holon or a charge on spectral function and the spin on spectral function, where both momenta and energies are essentially uh, convolved. And then when you do a calculation here at some low but finite temperatures, and very, well, let's say even at zero temperature, then the spectrum looks like this. It has a low energy branch. This is the spin on. It has a bandwidth which is related to J. And then there is a charge on branch. This is this dashed uh, line here. And then people have proposed, for instance, in this uh, paper by Peter Horsch and also others, that there can be a spectral building principle where the energies are actually de decomposed of spin on and charge on contributions. And then you can essentially resolve in the financial systems, these are all individual levels. This is what you're seeing here. And then you see the spectral response. But what is somehow remarkable, and uh, I think people have not interpreted that necessarily in the way uh, we did before, is that when you, when, you, when you look at the spin on dispersion, it stops at the momentum by over two, and there's nothing, oops, and there's nothing on the right hand side. Okay, there's no, even though there would be eigenstates in the spectral function, the overlap is essentially going to zero. And the question is, why is that so? And the Barton formulation of this charge on and spin on actually gives us very interesting insights. So we performed in this, or Annabelle has performed in this paper a couple of years ago, a slave fermion mean field theory. And what, what it turns out when you do this calculation is that um, the spin ons, they form essentially a Fermi C at zero temperature, which are occupied until uh, wave vector, up to the wave vector by over two. At zero temperature, this is just a sharp Fermi C. And when we now create a hole, when we find a hole in the system, then what can it do? It has to create a charge on and it has to remove a, hole, a spin on. But it can only remove a spin on where there is a spin on. And in the Fermi C, we only have spin ons up to uh, a, a wave vector by over two and nothing beyond here. Right, in this, uh, at this higher momenta. And this is one simple interpretation of this asymmetry of the, of the spectral weight. Good. And the question is, yeah, and, uh, uh, so, so, so this, this, what would happen in the higher temperatures, then the frequency is smeared out. And also in the upper spectrum, we, uh, we see more and more of the spectral weight appearing at higher momenta by over two. So this is what we have been doing in this paper. And we have also proposed a way of measuring up a spectra uh, in a quantum gas microscope setting by essentially coupling one tube, which is the physical system to a probe 
tube uh, and then by tunneling by modulation essentially one can uh, create really a, a hole of engine a hole into the into the into the physical system and the properties of this hole are then mapped out in this probe system so if you want to know the details about this this is described in this paper a couple of years back mm -hmm. Good. So this is just as a starter. This 1D physics is, of course, I mean, uh, studied over decades already and very well understood. Um, what we wanted to do now is, uh, because of the motivation which the experiment experiments gave us, we wanted to uh, look at higher dimensional systems. And uh, really, we were thinking about a two, yeah, quasi two-dimensional system, and we wanted to see, uh, when we punch in a hole now, uh, what is going to happen. Also, this is a topic, of course, with past history uh, because of the um, yeah, uh, uh, hype of high temperature superconductors uh, a couple of uh, decades ago. Uh, people were looking at that problem um, um, very intensely, but now we have new numerical tools at our disposal to study that, that problem, which may help us to understand uh, more physics. And what we have in particular done is we have um, set up some DMRG calculations for quasi two dimensional systems or quasi one dimensional systems. I don't know what it means, like a cylinder which is very, very long but has a short circumference. So they're essentially sheets uh, of the system, and we can control essentially the accuracy uh, of this numerical approach very well. So this, these results are, yeah. We can, we can check for their convergence and um, all the results which I'm reporting here, they are uh, converged in the, in the bond dimension, but not in the system size, okay? So we're looking at, at these cylinders, which are typically consisting out of four legs. So this is an exaggeration here, this picture. It's a very thin uh, cylinder. So these uh, techniques have been yeah, uh, developed by Mike Saladl, uh, who is now at Berkeley, and Frank Bormann, who is my colleague at TUM, and they can be used very efficiently to study dynamics in these systems. Okay, good. Um, okay, maybe I should say a couple of more words. So we can use the DMRG algorithm for finding the ground state of the system. This has been done already uh, much longer ago, and um, then, People have been thinking about how to do efficiently a time evolution of the system, and this has been done in this paper here, which I'm quoting. Anyway, what I want to show you now uh, is a so-called dimensional crossover. So the idea is that we first start with decoupled one-dimensional chains. We bunch in a hole, and then, of course, we recover the same physics as before. Uh, we see this ballistic uh, motion of, of the hole. Um, when, when we release it. And this is essentially shown here in the bottom plot on the very left. I have now anisotropic couplings or hoppings in the X and in the Y direction. Okay. In the X direction, I always have a hopping which is of unit, yeah, order one, or uh, which is one, or which I use as units of energy. And in the Y direction, I vary. If the y is zero, then I just have this um, uh, one-dimensional case again. We see this fast propagation of the hole. It reflects back from our comparatively uh, short cylinder also here. The cylinder has uh, yeah, 10, 10 sides, something. Um, it reflects back, but we see a, a, linear, a linear motion. When we introduce a little bit of coupling in the y direction, then what is going to happen is there's still kind of a branch which propagates out, but then uh, it's not as quantum coherent anymore, right? So there is a, uh, much more of the, of the charge and is kept back. When I increase that even further, I see this effect even stronger, if you want. And for the isotropic uh, hopping, then it seems even as if I have, well, one fast velocity, which then crosses over to a very slow velocity, and there is no uh, free propagation of the, of the charge on anymore. Michael. Yes. This scale of what? This plot. Ah, so what is it? The time scale? No, what is plotted on here? Yes, on the, uh, so sorry, this, this is essentially a color map plot. Of the expectation value of the of the whole density as a function of distance. Okay, uh -huh. 
So this is now distance one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Along but you also have no initial distance, right? Distance, uh, I the, system, the system is maybe something like, yeah, uh, uh, I put in a hole and I ask compared to the position where it has been. So this would uh -huh. be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, how does it propagate? Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was not very clear because I know this figure so well already. <laughs> and time is shown on the y-axis and distance in the x-axis. So a black line here means a ballistic propagation of the hole. When it and, and then there is the wall, essentially it comes back. Or let's just look at it at a very short time. Scale. How do you, you initialize the system to justify uh, annihilation operators? How do you initialize? We initialize the system in such a way that the system is in the anti-ferromagnetic ground state, and then uh, we create a hole in it. It's really like in the ARPES measurement, we instantaneously punch in a hole in the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the plot is uh, the integrated uh, with the uh, this is a circle. Each each kind of distance means uh, distance once means you you just added these four uh, four points thick. Yes. No, in that case, it's really just the distance in x direction because of the anisotropy. This this we will look at different distance measures later. But here you can think about it just in the in the in the x direction. Uh, Ah, so so the the, the, the thing which uh, runs diagonally is also fine for you. So that pick up there, or it can just go first two step up and then shift to the x also fine, right? For you, so this way. No, here it's really just the distance in x direction. For instance, when she punch in the hole here, distance one means just density at this side. Distance two means ah, at this side. I see, not not integrated along the slice. So. Just really on the neighbor inside. Yes, in this line where we punched in the hole. What? What? what, what? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Yes. So this is what uh, what we have. It's really just you know what I want to advocate here is that obviously there's a very different picture in the two cases. Ah. Right. Uh, of the of the uh, of the one D e case and of this quasi two dimensional case. So we are looking certainly, even though we have very thin cylinders, we are looking certainly at very different physics. Ah. And if we have a truly two-dimensional system, this is also very much expected, right? Because the ground state has these strong local antiferromagnetic patterns, which the whole is seeing. But let's analyze this isotropic uh, case. Uh, last question. Uh, the, uh, what? Uh, right, uh, wait, red light, what is it? Yes, red. this is the average now. So we can say that the, the probability of Finding a hole somewhere along this distance when we integrate over it is one. So I can take the average position ah. out of this probability distribution, and this is the red line. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, say this is the probability of B at a distance phi. For all times, you integrate long time direction or what? Right. No, no. Uh, at a certain slide time, the probability of finding one hole somewhere is one, right? So I can just say what is the average distance at a certain ah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. You integrate the red line. Or it's just, just a case. Yeah, I see. It's just the, the average distance away from the position where I analyze oh, I see, I see. I see. Oh, the yeah, uh, the curve really should be actually not a curve, but a set of points. But, but it doesn't matter. That well, that is absolutely true. But the time is very finely um, uh, spaced, so it's about one over a hundred in yeah. terms of hopping. So you don't see individual points. See. But in principle, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. No, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun that uh, that. Uh, uh, that you are saying the same time as is very finely spaced, uh, uh, but I still see very discrete uh, uh, color palette uh, in the time direction. So when I go uh, in time uh, from down to up, yes, I see. Uh, I, I see. Uh -huh. I but that's a very that's a very simple origin, right? So the simplest origin of thinking about this: think about a fully polarized uh, spin state yeah. and flip one spin in it. 
then we do know that the analytic solution of the time evolution of this flipped spin are the Bessel functions. And the Bessel functions have quantum interference, essentially. And this is what you see here, right? So the black, black, white, black, white, uh, along the time direction is just some interference effect from this, from this particle moving, moving away, if you want. I see. So if I would... But the time is very finely graded, but in X direction, the distance is very coarse because we, I only show yeah, yeah, yeah. the insights. No, I thought I, I thought in the y direction the distance of course, but but if I plot the cut, I would see nice function. I see. So it's just yes, nice. it would be a smooth function which goes a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Good. So this is the the difference. I mean, uh, without perpendicular coupling, yeah, with fast propagation of the charge on, of the whole position, and for with with uh, coupling to the other rungs, we see that the whole is strongly slowed down. Let's analyze these average curves, like this uh, red curve, a little bit more. And now I plot, I, I really think about the isotropic case where the hopping in X and Y direction is the same. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, and I want to uh, ask what is the average distance now? But I count in Manhattan distance. So Manhattan distance, you know, is counting the number of hops on the on the square let or yeah, the, it, it's kind of like it's not the Euclidean distance which they which goes diagonal, but it goes around the corners of the lattice essentially. And we will see later why I'm using this distance measure. But now I take into account all options of um, uh, of distance, right? Just not not only around the x-axis, but it also go along the y-axis essentially. And now we, we show here for different values of hopping, but everything rescaled as a function of the super exchange interaction, this Manhattan distance for three different values of the interaction or of this ratio of T over J. And what we see is that at late times, those curves propagate more or less in a parallel way. So this means the late time dynamics must have to do something with, uh, with, 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 with spin physics because it scales somehow with J. When I rescale the same plot, not in J, but in units of the hopping, then the late time data departs. Here I show it only for very short times up to this time here, but the initial time scales, they are collapsing. So at initial times, it has to do something with the, uh, with the whole motion. But there seem to be two different effects going on, a part of a whole and a part of a uh, spin physics. We can also look at local spin correlations. So SI uh, dot SI plus delta, where delta goes to one nearest neighbor direction. And here also we see a very good linear growth at late times of these spin correlations. So what does that mean if you have a late time linear growth when I, when I create an excitation in the system, this means that I have a well-defined quasi-particle, actually. This means that I have a set factor, uh, if you think, yeah, if you want to think about it in a thermoliquid theory or something like this, uh, which, which is finite, uh, and, 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 and I have a ballistic motion of a very uh, well-defined quasi-particle. This is what we observe numerically here. So let's try to understand this a little bit more in terms of a physical picture. Ah, and also, right, so why is this bending off here at later times? This is a pure finite size effect because we have uh, finite uh, size cylinders. If we would increase that or would be able to increase it, then uh, we expect that this curve uh, continues to go on like this in a linear fashion. And these finite size effects, they are also visible in here. Uh, and the time scale where this sets in depends a bit on, on the ratio of the parameters. So here it's, it's less clear to see. This is why I show you this additional plot here. Okay, good. So this is the, the results which we have. So now let's think about, again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a baton language about what is going to happen. So we have in the strong coupling limit where the interaction strength U is very large, we have a fast pole and slow spin backgrounds. So I can think about to a very lowest, very, very zero order approximation, I can think about uh, the spin background being static. When the hole now propagates through the system, what, what does it do? And what is the difference compared to the one dimensional case what I showed you before? Let's assume the hole propagates now through my two dimensional system from its initial position to over here, okay? 
then what happens is that I create many, many unhappy, unhappy spins. You know, my super exchange interactions want to favor anti-aligned nearest neighboring spins as is shown in the upper plot. I always have up, down, up, down in all directions, if I have not mistakenly drawn uh, one here, something like down, up, down, uh, down, up, down, and so on. But when the whole passes through, what happens is uh, that I not only have a distortion uh, locally here, uh, but I also distort my antiferromagnet in the y direction, right? I have now aligned spins where my hole has been. And the, the, the charge on is, a, is essentially the further I move it away, the more energy it costs because the, because the charge on distorts the 2D nail state. Okay. So it costs energy proportional, proportional to the distance uh, which the charge on is moving. We call that, in some sense, we call it string. It creates a string uh, where it has moved, and the energy cost is proportional to the length of the, screen, of the string. Of course, again, energy from delocalizing my charge on, because I want to uh, uh, optimize my kinetic energy if I want to have hopping energy at my disposal, which I want to get rid of. So I have a competition between the hopping energy scale and, the, and, this, uh, and, this, um, and this energy, oh, sorry, maybe, and this energy scale of this, of this string which we are creating. And this gives me a, a typically emergent length scale, right? I can't go infinitely far away uh, of, my, of my hole, which I've punched in this system. Okay, so what does that essentially mean? How should I think about my many body wave function now? My many body wave function, psi, we should think of it as a superposition of many of these strings which are departing, uh, uh, of holes which are departing, departing from my spin excitation. Okay, the hole can move like this, or just up, or like this, or to the left. And when I average it, um, I have essentially something like a dressed magnetic particle. It's dressed by fast fluctuations of the hole. And this would be, or this is a magnetic polarum. But uh, the point of our analysis, which we have been making, is why don't we actually look at these individual contributions of the wave function? Very much in the spirit of what quantum gas microscopes can do at the moment, right? So if they would take a picture of this averaged quantum anybody wave function, they would see more something like this, what I've shown you on the first uh, line. Maybe they measured that uh, in the first measurement, this in the second one, and some other configuration in the whatever. Uh, 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 measurement. Okay, so that's the idea. And the question, uh, and then once we have this individual picture at our disposal, which would be yeah, a checkerboard for, pattern for the perfect antiferromagnet, and wherever my string has moved, um, uh, I make some defects like this one here. Then what we have been developing in this, in this paper here in collaboration with, um, with Markus Greiner's group is we've been saying, okay, let's do the most simplest and maybe also a little bit naive uh, thing. Let's subtract the checkerboard pattern from this measured snapshot, okay? And then we can extract the whole out of that. So what are the caveats of that? Of course, first of all, we have SU2 symmetry. So my checkerboard is not uh, oriented along one direction, but it's oriented along my SU2 sphere. Okay. Um, and also we have spin fluctuations, unavoidably uh, strong, even strong ones in the system. But still what, what, the, what the idea was of this analysis is that we can also characterize these static defects essentially in the antiferromagnetic ground state and subtract these properties from the from the, from the new data, essentially. And so we have a baseline signal of strings, which comes from the imperfections of the method, and we have new physics, essentially. And if this signal of new physics is strong enough, we might be able to say something about these, about these strings. So this is this idea, uh, which we have put, put forward there. And Jason Ho has written last year a nice paper where he said, okay, we can, one can even be with a couple of additional uh, measurement overhead, one can be even cleverer and uh, extract these, these strings uh, in a more elaborate way. If we do this, 
uh, what, uh, um, what is going to happen? I mean, first of all, the point is we cannot only measure these snapshots in experiment, but we can also measure the snapshots in our matrix product states. So there has been an algorithm by Geoffrey Vidal uh, and others, I think he was the first one uh, mentioning it, to Monte Carlo sample Fox space configurations from a matrix product state. And that's what we have implemented. And we can now apply this technique, which I've been presenting to you, uh, to our numerical state. This has the advantage that we have a very accurate uh, quantum anybody wave function, and we can try to analyze essentially the properties of this. And this is what we did, what Annabelle has been doing in this, in this paper, which we published last year. So when we do this and we go back to our analysis from before, uh, you know, we had, we had this red line, this is the numerical result. Uh, for the uh, for the propagation of the of the of the whole, and now you see also why I I was plotting Manhattan distance because the length of the strings which I was showing here this is essentially best counted in Manhattan distance right so like one two three four is the length of this string it it, it the whole uh, underwent four hops so this is how I count uh, how we count the length of the scale here and then. Uh, we can also precisely measure with this procedure uh, I was presenting before the string length of this matrix product state. And when we do that, we see that initially the string length uh, in the matrix product state increases linearly in the same fashion as the whole hole is moving around. But then the string length okay, increases a little more, but then it starts to saturate or maybe even decay very slightly, okay? This is what we observe. And this fits very well uh, to the picture I was advocating before, right? So initially, we want to get rid of kinetic energy. The whole spreads out. But then the, we have to pay potential energy, essentially, because of the distorted stream spins in the background. And at some point, uh, my system is confined. I have a linearly increasing confining force. And then the typical length scale is achieved, and this length scale is two sides here in that case. And of course, I can tune the parameters to make this shorter or longer. And this depends on the steepness of the, of the potential, essentially, of my linear confinement force. And this is already very reassuring, because uh, what is the physics now? We essentially have this formation of a bound state, and then essentially the uh, bound state is propagating by itself uh, through the system via spin physics. And this is the second time scale, right? So now we can understand in a very intuitive way, the first fast time scale, which is on the order of the hopping. So we got the scaling collapse of the hopping, if you remember. Uh, and then uh, we can understand that the late time scale should be actually governed by, by, by spin physics, which is also consistent with the numerics. Any comments or questions at this point? Uh, Michael, uh, if I can still take the time from you. Uh, in previous uh, several slides before, uh, you were showing us this comparison of uh, 1D to 2D. And on 1D plots, I, I, I've seen uh, the reflection. Yes, here. So uh, on the left plot, I see that it, uh, the red line goes uh, to the distance, uh, which is probably uh, then goes back because uh, it uh, reaches the edge of, of your system. Is it true? Yes, precisely. Here we see yeah. a coherent motion of a whole. So I'm wondering, I wonder why uh, you see, well, maybe, why do you see this so nice reflection? Right? Uh, but on 2D, which is all eventually not bigger than, yeah, then you're just plotting it as goodbye. Yes. And this is precisely this confining force which I've been uh, showing to you, right? So the, the hole wants to move. Yes. But then it gets uh, yeah, held back. By the, by the spin background. And yes. now it has to move collectively much, much slower with the spin exchange interaction. If we waited now for a very long time and could still simulate the dynamics of the system, then this uh, new quasi particle would, would also bump off uh, the wall. But it is so slow that we can't see it on that, uh, on that, on that plot. Uh -huh. It is still a coherent quasi particle, which is uh -huh. holistically moving. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. and, and in this picture, which I was advocating to, is really uh, very, very simple because I mean, it is very well known that it can't be the full truth because we do have Druckmann loops 
So it means holes can go back uh, and so on, but it this is out, my next question. Yes. Yes, it turns out Truckman loops, but perturbatively we can't argue them away because actually they are they are simply there. They are not very abundant. When you think about how many configurations are actually going back, they are just really very few. <clears throat> compared to the possible configurations which you have. And this is why this effective picture is actually very working rather nicely to explain the, the, the physics. So uh -huh. the purest order we can neglect these like, Dragman loops. And I know there has been a very nice work also by, by Boris and by Nikolai Popovev and their, I think student Karlström um, and also by Eugene and, 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 and Fabian Brust and, and collaborators where they were looking at the whole motion in an infinite temperature background. And there you could uh, analyze a bit better the role of these Dragman uh, loops. And it turns out while there is a quantitative change, qualitatively, there's not so much uh, of a difference. <clears throat> Okay, but now, I mean, this is now still interpretation of the numerical results. What is very nice is that Eugene Demler and Fabian Cruz, they have developed also a so-called geometric string theory, which actually literally takes this picture, which I have presenting uh, you before, uh, and says, okay, we have now, a, 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 we assume a product state uh, of a whole moving, in the spin background, that this effectively is a hole moving on a beta lattice because each time the hole moves around, a new configuration of spins is generated. So these are orthogonal states. So you can think about this <clears throat> as moving around on a beta lattice. This has also been advocated by Brinkman and Rice uh, decades ago and so on. But, but if you take this picture uh, and then uh, ask for a given microscopic proper parameters, what would be the string string length in this, in this theory? And the, in this theory, the string length would be this light blue shaded area. And you see this gives us a very good estimate, order of estimate, order of magnitude estimate for the, for the string length, which we are seeing in the matrix product state. In the MPS, we get a little bit of a lower string length, which is actually good because what this, uh, what this geometric string theory, GSD, is neglecting is um, spin fluctuations. And so the back action of the spins on the string is neglected, and this would rather shorten the string uh, instead of uh, lengthening it, right? So in that way, what we observe that numerics is a little bit below geometric string theory is kind of can be understood in that way. And then you can even play the trick a little bit more and ask, okay, let's assume that we have additionally a spin on and add this dispersion of a spin onto it, which is known from spectral functions, for instance, and then we, we obtain the light pink curve. I, don't, I hope you see this well on the projected screen. Uh, and you see this, this is also matching rather nicely the full numerical result. And there is no adjustable parameter in this, in this theory, essentially. Uh, and so we thought, okay, well, I mean, uh, this seems to be, at least for this two-dimensional antiferromagnet, a rather decent uh, description of the physics which is going on. And it's also very simple uh, in some sense. Yeah, it's a bit, I can't resist saying that it's a bit of shame that we didn't have offline workshop because there was a talk on how well it is a string theory also by, by other participants here, but you haven't been here, and the, on your talk, Gail is not here. So, but at least I invite to look on YouTube <laughs> the talks, and then probably you'll go to further discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, I mean, if, if, if somebody would be interested to discuss off, offline, off, 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 uh, after the, the, the talk uh, to me, they should just drop me an email. I would be very happy to exchange ideas, right? So this is, uh, even though I'm not uh, there uh, in person, I mean, just... Yeah, I will invite you to, to give me some mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to, to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, um, right. So now let's let's go a step beyond that and ask actually, so this is a different paper now, uh, how does the ARPES spectra look like given the physics which I've explained to you so far? Turns out when we think again about this, uh, this convolution picture, so now since, the, since we have a bound state in this picture of a charge on and a spin on, the momentum is not convolved of the two uh, contributions of the spin on and the charge on. The momentum is solely carried by the spin on, and only energies are convolved in some sense. 
So what it means is now, and that, that's, I think, a very interesting perspective, also um, uh, which we advocate here in this paper by Annabel and Fabian uh, and others. When we now look at the low energy properties of the spectral function, uh, then actually this, what we see is a single, as the dispersion of a single spino. And that's usually very, very non-trivial to measure, you know, because when you think about the structure factor measurement, neutron scattering, then what happens is that you take, you have your beam of neutrons, they are interacting, they make spin flip, but this is spin one excitation in an antiferromagnet. And a spin one excitation, uh, well, while it can be maybe decomposed in two spinons, the spinons would be uh, interacting with each other and you wouldn't know what happens to a, to a single spinon in an easy way. While here, if this is uh, a proper picture, then actually the APIS measurement allows us to really extract the dispersion of a single, uh, of a single spin. Michael, sorry, is this formal? Is it related to uh, this uh, uh, bounded lens of the screen? So I, I won't see it on D, right? So essentially, I mean, the formula assumes that we have a bound state of a charge on the spin on, and then the whole momentum in the end is carried by the, by the spin. And, and yeah. Mm -hmm. The final, final lens of the screen, one D could buy because of this kind of divergence. Of the, the point lens. is somehow, where does this, where does the charge on enter? The charge on enters uh, in, in a numerical, re it enters into the set factor of the quasi particle. The set factor of the quasi particle uh -huh. consists of a spin on part and of a charge on part. Uh -huh. And depending on how big, the how far the charge moves away, uh, this influences then the, uh, the overall weight of the new quasi particle. Oh. Right? And here, however, we, the, both of them, they are confined, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so and, and this is the dispersion which we have. And I think, I mean, these are pretty nice dispersions for uh, this ARPA spectrum. People have tried very hard to do Monte Carlo, to do exact diagonalization. And recently, there's also been a nice work. Uh, by uh, Philippe Cobo and co is it true? And co workers uh, who have a variational answers for a two dimensional PEP states for the spectra. They feature qualitatively similar structure, similar features uh, as what we have had here in this paper here. So we have a well defined quasi particle uh, branch at low energies, which is the so called magnetic, I mean, we can call it magnetic polaron. It's my bound object of a fast charge on around the spin. Okay. So this is what we see here. But now analyze, let's analyze this bound state picture a little bit more. So we said spin on this, the, the, oh, well, my time is not right. Spin on departs from the, uh, charge on departs from the spin on, and there's a linear confinement for us. And Bulevsky uh, and, and, and Komsky and the collaborators have uh, proposed then in the, uh, in, the, in the 60s, I mean, what is going to happen is with this linear confinement for us, yeah, we do know what we have. This, the solution of a single quantum mechanical particle in a linear confinement for us are the area functions. We know all the properties of it. In particular, we will have vibrational modes of this object uh, and the energy scale between the ground state and the first vibrational mode should scale as j over t to the power of two thirds. And that's precisely what we can, ex oh, precisely. that's what we can extract very accurately in, uh, in, in, in this matrix product state uh, calculation. This quantity by itself has not been analyzed so much uh, in the literature, but we could extract from quantum Monte Carlo data by Mischenko, uh, um, uh, um, which is also unbiased Monte Carlo data, the different peak positions in their spectral function, and this is what they, what they found. But the point is, I mean, they have to do, you have to know the spectrum to extract this energy uh, difference here. And Monte Carlo is also a bit, yeah, it has some challenges there too. And we can now look at this in our uh, numerical result and ask where is the position of the second peak? This is the blue dashed line. And this is roughly at a constant energy offset at all, almost all momenta. This is very similar. And that's very nice, no? Because this, is really promoting again the picture that we have a bound state of a charge on the spin on because and that the, our convolution picture, uh, which I've shown, and the whole, whole momentum is carried by the spin on essentially. Okay. Good. So this is this uh, detail in this paper here. Okay. Good. So now, actually, I mean, I should 
maybe even stop now, no? Uh, because the people want to may want to ask some further questions. Is that right, Misha? Well, we still have a bit of time. I so so when when so five minutes or something or two minutes or ah, they're not so restricted. Oh, okay, good. So then maybe I, I rush over this a little. So what, what we also uh, thought um, in, in collaboration with, with Markus Greiner's uh, group is, okay, let's just uh, uh, run the experiment, punch in many holes and try to ask, is this geometric string theory doing any good? Yes or no? And it turns out that the string theory is describing the experimental data very well. But also other theories like a resonance valence form biflux uh, spin liquid ansatz works very well. I mean, it's basically indistinguishable uh, from the string theory within the experimental accuracy. It's very hard to say uh, that one theory favors the other one. Or what we know is that we, when we just take an antiferromagnet and sprinkle in random holes, then this doesn't work at all. I mean, obviously this should not, it's just a check that, that nothing uh, bad is happening essentially. But we can't necessarily say which of these theories working better. So we were a bit disappointed uh, in the beginning be be because we are hoping to see clearer favorings uh, to either of, of, of the theories, right? But then, I mean, a quote came <laughs> across our minds, which is, I mean, Steve Kibberson once said in a, or wrote in a science uh, uh, commentary uh, that the theoretical problem is so hard that there isn't any obvious criterion for right. Uh, so it's very hard to select the right theory. So this motivated us uh, to pose a more general question maybe. So can we, given that we have an information about snapshots of the many body wave function, answer, or at least, I mean, have some indication which of a collection of theories is more predictive in general. And this has been worked out in, 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 in that paper. And the idea is the following. So we take a quantum, uh, we take a convolutional neural network and feed the convolutional neural network snapshots of two theories geometric strings and bifluxes. And then we let the convolutional neural network distinguish between or learn the features of the theories, right? This is not beyond observables. It takes really high correlations into account. The disadvantage is we don't know yet precisely what it is doing, okay? So I mean, it has to be taken with a, what it is precisely learning. Uh, so we have to take this all with a grain of salt. But then we can show this convolutional neural network the truth if we want. We can show it the experiment and ask, is it more geometric string-like or more biflux-like, okay? And then we could, and then what is the outcome? It turns out that the outcome is as follows, that up to doping of, let's say, 10%, it indeed seems that the geometric string theory is a little favored over the, over the biflux theory from our convolutional uh, neural network. Uh, beyond that, it's very uncertain what is really happening. But of course, these strings, independent strings, which our theory is assuming is only expected also to hold at low to intermediate uh, doping and, and, and not beyond. And of course, this also doesn't tell us that if there is a real correct theory uh, at our disposal, that this would work even better, right? We just from a given set of theories, we can ask which one is working in general better given this, this neural, neural network. Mm. So, uh, and, and sorry, and, sorry, I, had, I looked into the chat. So this, this, oh, sorry, ah. <laughs> this was, uh, this was this idea uh, of this, of this, of this, of this project which we had here, which was Annabelle was carrying out uh, very successfully. Okay, so with that, I really come to an end now. I'd like to summarize. So I've advocated that the Spartan picture is really a useful picture uh, in the interpretation of a hole in an antiferromagnet, both in one and in two dimensions. And maybe neural networks can be used more generally to analyze uh, snapshots or, or, and categorize snapshots uh, of quantum gas microscopes. We also have now, I have not even cited that here, a new paper where we apply it uh, to a many body localized uh, phase of, of, of the boson experiment in Markus Kleiner's group. And of course, I mean, there are many, many open questions which we can, um, which we, which we can follow up. The first one is what happens actually at finite temperatures? 
Turns out that infinite temperatures, the physics is already uh, very interesting of this individual hole uh, in, in the background. Finer temperatures are even uh, more interesting. There's a recent experiment also in Markus Kreiner's group, which is kind of uh, trying first attempts to study this problem. And also, more generally speaking, when we think about finer temperatures, it would be actually really good to have a faithful quantum simulator where we do know uh, where we have a quantum algorithm, if you want, to prepare finite temperature states. Because in these experiments, we can't very well control uh, the temperature. And also, we do not know whether there is a, a correct way of thinking about temperature because they are isolated. Uh, they have experimented tricks to cool the system. Uh, and so going into that, this will be one thing that, that we are going uh, heading out uh, in the next couple of years. Then there's an interesting question of the dynamics of multiple holes in a maybe numerical way, two holes, are there strings between the holes? Is there a binding effect? Yes or no. And also we could take this picture of this spin on low energy excitation and ask, can we analyze ARPA spectra of frustrated magnets, for instance, triangular, um, triangular uh, um, uh, magnetic systems to gain some insights about low energy properties of, of quasi particles. There, even though if even though they might realize a spin liquid uh, phase which has deconfined uh, spinons, it's not necessarily the case that the whole on and the spinons deconfined, for instance. But that's all uh, subject uh, to investigations. Yeah. So this is the perspective on these magnetic polarons in the in a two-dimensional antiferromagnet, which I wanted to give you. Other questions? Questions? Online people, offline people, anybody? Well, offline, I don't see. <laughs> uh, here was one second. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about the, Well, actually, one question about the, uh, the numerical tools which you are using. So yes. I didn't get it at the beginning. You said you're using a cylinder, which is rather thin, but I, I didn't get what is the perimeter of it. Uh, yes. So, I mean, the perimeter in principle, we can put any number in it, right? But how do we uh, set up the code? We essentially still have a matrix product state. So this means we snake around the cylinder. And in order to get converged results, we have to restrict the cylinder to four sides. To so four sides. And uh, uh, yes, and you partially answered. Actually, what I wanted to know is, do you encode every side with a matrix product state and then you snake like this? Or you just encode the four sides in one MPS and you continue? No, it's actually a snake. Uh, it's a snake. Geometry. This is more efficient, but then you have to think about which way you're doing the time evolution because you can't use DBD algorithms directly because you have longer range uh, interactions. Yes. This has been developed in this paper by Mike Sullivan and Frank Borman in 2015. So you can take an MPO time evolution where you're saying, okay, the zeroth order variant of this algorithm is you directly apply e to the minus i h t in a way that you say this is approximately one minus i h t delta t in a in a uh, uh, so you make very small time steps uh, and then I mean okay it, it's more complicated than that, but this is the philosophy and then you apply an operator on a state uh, and then you get a new matrix product state out of that and okay you optimize and make that yeah you okay to do that. but you can't use standard DVD for that. Great, thank you. And this seems to work very well. I mean, it's, it's very efficient uh, at the moment. Of course, there are also full two-dimensional tensor network uh, tools. So um, um, uh, Claudius Hubig and Ignacio Sirak and us, we have a paper on a hole in the, with PEPs in a two-dimensional antiferromagnet. It's very hard to get conversion results, but there was a heroic effort by Claudius yeah. and also some nice so, results came out. So actually, maybe since it's just a workshop, just do you know, and, and about this uh, three tensor network approach, do you know whether they were able to do dynamics with that? Okay, they, I'm not so familiar with, uh, yeah. the, with the recent developments there, but I'm not aware of that. Uh, okay, technology. but this, Thank this you. doesn't mean now anything because I really, I really don't. One would have to look it, look it up. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, could could you? Uh, once again, 
give the operational definition of a bound state of a uh, charge on and, and uh, uh, spin ons. So, uh, because you are, you are doing some calculations, you are calculating some observables. How do you interpret the existence of the states in terms of observables? So, uh, of course, the most easy observable uh, to, to compute would be just the position of the average position of the hole, right? This would be the red curve, uh, for instance, here in this data. And then we can't, however, distinguish what is a spin on, what is a, what is a charge on, what is a stream, essentially. Because uh, the magnetic polaron on its own would move through the system with a certain velocity. Yes. Right. This is your point. But what we can do now is we have a many body wave function. A many body wave function is a superposition of Fock configurations. So some configurations are in my Hilbert space. Okay. With local onset configurations, okay. hole up and down. And those we can sample from the matrix product state. So there is okay. a value. So your definition is not in terms of the observables, but in terms of some intrinsic. Well, it's a new way. I mean, this is the whole, the biggest, the, the, I think the what is kind of uh, um, uh, important for me to stress is that it's a new way of analyzing a many body wave function. It's not, uh, not, uh, not right. thinking about uh, looking at the wave at observables, but we, we, we I don't know, uh, uh, in a, we search, we make a surgery of our wave functions. We, we cut out, if you want, uh, Fox based configurations, and those can be analyzed now. I see. And even though, on average, my magnetic polaron would be just a dressed spin particle, when yes. I look at individual snapshots, it's something like I mean, if you want to put it in big words, I mean, you could say it's something like a hidden order or so. We can look at hit where the hidden strings are. Uh, and using really this algorithm, which I told you before, very naive algorithm, this certainly can be improved by someone, uh, that you take a snapshot from your uh, matrix product states, subtract a nail pattern, and on top of these differences, we, uh, we, we, we try to um, um, extract where the string was, and these are these blue dotted lines. And this is what Annabelle actually had put a lot of effort uh, in developing a code uh, for the string extraction out of these snapshots, essentially, which have been applied to the experimental data and to these uh, matrix product state snapshots. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you. I don't see any other question. In that case, we thank Michael again. I stop recording. Yeah, thanks also for these uh, very nice discussions. Uh, that was really great. And as I said, I mean, if someone wants to talk to me, I mean, please just drop an email. I'm always happy to, to discuss.